we need to talk about the misunderstanding of women's hormones. In this video, we're going to cover important hidden history of women's health and how estrogen is not the female reproductive hormone we've been led to believe it is. You've probably heard some things about estrogen. Or maybe you've never learned anything about estrogen or your hormones. I want to change that by the end of this video. First, let's go back to where things started to go wrong. Now, the misunderstanding of women's hormones comes from the misunderstanding of women's health, at least in the West. To be fair, women's physiology is complex and should be as it's responsible for creating the most complex organisms in the known universe. This complexity is still being uncovered and there is so much left to understand. The fluctuations of hormones and complexity of feedback mechanisms that drive women's physiologies is spectacular. The uterine lining is constantly rebuilt and then shed. Pituitary hormones fluctuate to organize the release of an egg. Ovarian hormones go up and down like a roller coaster to sink in time the preparation for the implantation of a fertilized egg and to nourish it as it grows. There's also a completely new organ the body can generate when needed, the placenta. The complexity of the womb has been undermined and overlooked by Western medicine. The traces of this are still present in our language to this day. The Greek word for womb is hystera. Hystericus means of the womb. That is where we get the word hysterical from. The womb was thought of as a source of madness by early physicians. We still call the removal of the womb or parts a hysterectomy. The psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud later popularized the diagnosis of hysteria. The diagnosis was used as a panacea to cover many physical and emotional symptoms women suffered with, and it evolved into the mental illness of hysterical neurosis, which remained in the DSM-3 until 1980. Scientists were trying their best to understand the connection between mind and body, the womb and health, hormones and emotions, but couldn't quite get it right. This ultimately undermined women's health and gave way to the medicalization of pregnancy and birth. Pre-modern medicine, the art and tradition of birthing was rich in wisdom and handled mostly by women. This tradition was replaced and upgraded with what was thought to be the new and improved modern way. Soon your doctor arrives to take charge of things. After the doctor has learned all he needs to know concerning you and the baby, a nurse will shave off your pubic hair and give you an enema to help clear the way for your baby's birth. When the mouth of the uterus has opened completely, the second stage of labor begins, and soon you will be taken to the delivery room. There is a table with sterile drapes to cover your abdomen, legs, and buttocks, and with sterile gowns, towels, and rubber gloves for the doctors and nurses. There will also be various sorts of anesthetics. Some mothers, perhaps you, may want a certain kind of anesthetic. Feel free to ask for it, but by all means leave the decision in your doctor's hand. And so you reach the delivery room, ready to deliver your baby. So you will know what to expect. Your doctor will tell you what he is going to do. Your doctor will be there, ready to hold the baby's head and to manipulate him gently so his shoulders, arms, body, and legs slide out easily. Thankfully, this doctor-centered paradigm is shifting and it's largely because of this woman. Let me introduce to you Katharina Dalton, absolute legend and queen. She pioneered research into women's hormones and built a better model than Freud of how and why a woman's psyche is influenced by hormones. Up until the 1970s, women's hormones were fairly mysterious to medicine. PMS was a joke, and there was no scientific explanation as to why a woman could experience emotional disturbances and PMS symptoms throughout the month. Medicine viewed PMS as something completely psychosomatic. It was medical doctor Katharina Dalton who proved there was a physical explanation for symptoms women experience related to their cycle. She looked a lot at the hormone progesterone, as she realized when she was pregnant for the first time and under the influence of increased progesterone, she didn't have her headaches anymore. She went on to show how women's hormones could cause PMS symptoms and was able to connect what we think of as emotional and mental symptoms to the underlying physiology. Another pioneer in the understanding of women's hormones is physiologist Dr. Raymond Peake. 
His work on understanding women's hormones inspired Dr. John Lee, the guy who coined the phrase estrogen dominance. For decades, Ray Peat has written extensively about hormones, helping to reframe how we understand their fundamental functions. His work shows that estrogen is better thought of as a stress hormone, but we'll get to that later on. In an ideal world, we would first understand the fundamentals of how a hormone or body system works before experimenting with drugs which interrupt these pathways. But that is not the story that follows. Before we continue, I want to explain some important terms. Endogenous means produced inside the body. Exogenous means produced outside the body. This will be important to understand for the rest of the video. All right, here we go. Estrogen isn't just a female hormone. Men need and produce estrogen too. Both men and women produce estrogens in their brain, skin, fat, bones, muscle, and other organs in the body. There is no such thing as estrogen, but there are estrogens. Meet estriol, estrone, and estradiol. These together are estrogens, sometimes called oestrogens. They have different functions and strengths. Remember endogenous and exogenous? These three estrogens are produced inside the body, therefore are endogenous hormones. Exogenous estrogens are produced outside the body and can go into two categories, natural, such as hops or soy, and man-made, such as the pill, plastics, and pesticides. Now both have estrogenic effects. This means that all these different estrogen-like chemicals, man-made or natural, can act on a cell and produce effects we can class as estrogenic. Now, some of these effects are good and some are bad. For example, a good effect estrogens have is that they help with growth of the circulatory system and placenta during pregnancy and breast development. A bad effect is weight gain, unregulated and exaggerated growth of cells with excessive proliferation of tissues, such as in breast cancer. Before they really knew or understood much about how reproductive hormones worked, scientists were obsessed with estrogen, thinking they'd found the key to unlock the mysteries of women's health. They seemed to think that estrogen given to women in high amounts would have endless positive effects, and the stronger acting the estrogen, the better. In hindsight, they were not so concerned with figuring out how estrogens worked in the body and how they affected women's bodies. They were just trying to find chemicals that had strong estrogenic activity that they could use and sell. Science operates in the unknown and there isn't anything wrong with that. But now it's time for us to judge that framework and the fruits of this estrogen-centric paradigm. Let's go back to the early days in the world of synthetic hormones. Scientists were looking for a super estrogen they could give women to prevent miscarriage, stop morning sickness or inhibit ovulation. Enter BPA. BPA was originally researched for use as a synthetic estrogen drug by this chap here, Sir Edward Charles Dodds. Unfortunately, this would not be the most infamous chemical Sir Dodds would be involved in. BPA was found not to be the estrogen powerhouse Dodds was looking for, as it wasn't potent enough for his plan. Because of its chemical properties, it was later found to be a useful additive in plastic manufacturing. BPA was deemed weaker in strength compared to endogenous estrogens, and no one gave a second thought to spreading it profusely into our everyday lives. BPA was used in receipts, clothes, inside food cans, dental fillings, and of course plastic foodwares. Also in baby dummies, drink bottles, straws, medical equipment, and the list goes on and on. It should have been an obviously bad idea to put a known estrogenic chemical into everyday household items, especially because it was known to scientists from the late 1800s to be such, thanks to the Russian chemist Alexander Dianin, who first discovered its estrogenic activity. Now, if you're like me, you might be wondering how and why a known endocrine disrupting chemical could end up pervading our environment. Dr. Sarah Vogel's paper in the American Journal of Public Health explains, this has to do with how chemical safety is assessed and classified. It wasn't really until the end of the 21st century that the idea of an endocrine disruptor was on the FDA's radar. Before that, chemicals were classed into either toxic, think acute like burning, or carcinogenic, think more long-term effects. If a chemical was classed as a carcinogen by the FDA, then it can't be allowed in the food chain, 
even in packaging, but toxins can be allowed in a dose-dependent manner. Around the 1940s and 1950s, BPA's general toxicity was classed as very low, but its carcinogenic potential wasn't studied until the 1970s, and its endocrine-disrupting effects were an afterthought. It wasn't until 1997 that researchers studied the effects of BPA on pregnant mice, which proved its estrogenic and carcinogenic effect in low doses, doses in the 40s, which were deemed safe by the FDA. BPA is still a controversial chemical, and mostly when air of its less than benign effects blew into the noses of companies, they didn't wait for the FDA to ban it, they just stopped using it. What they replaced it with is likely just as endocrine disrupting, but that's for another video. So Dodds gave up on BPA and began again, searching for his white whale of an estrogenic powerhouse. He succeeded and found the motherload, all-powerful estrogen compound, diethylstilbestro, also known as DES. Dodds had the idea that you ought to be able to make artificial substances in the laboratory, free from impurities to produce the full effects of the natural hormone, Francis Dickens. He thought he had hit the jackpot with this chemical. It was powerful, it was strong, it was estrogenic like you've never seen before. DES researcher Susan Bell reported that a gram of DES cost $2 to synthesize, while a gram of estradiol, bioidentical endogenous estrogen, cost $300 to synthesize. DES was so potent, its delivery could be made orally, not needing to be injected by a doctor. Although very proud of its discovery, Dodds was concerned about the potentially cancerous effects DES could have and its use in healthy women. He witnessed how male researchers working with DES in the lab were exposed and as a result developed breasts. After its synthesis results were released, Dodds saw the experimental applications for DES spreading by pharmaceutical companies, and along with this, his concern. Shortly after, Dodds published research showing that DES was causing miscarriages in animals studies and which now is producing medical horrors perhaps second only to thalidomide late in life abnormalities in reproductive organs and cancers are showing up in the offspring of those who took the hormone we're only just discovering that it was like a slow-acting thalidomide these Australian women all bear the scars of DES. It's given them cancers and robbed them of children. And it's given their mothers a terrible burden. Ultimately, I had one stillbirth whilst on stillbestrol. Massive doses of it right up through to eight months. The baby was born eight months, stillborn. When you say massive doses, how much? Up to 27 tablets a day. 27, 27 tablets a day? Tablets. It's denial all over the place. The medical profession does not like to look at its mistakes. Thanks to Pat Cody, the US Congress is pumping millions of dollars into research projects. One is just now revealing possible effects on the third generation, the grandchildren of those who took the drug. I'm actually seeing fertility specialists at the moment. The ones that I've seen, I give them the information and they just sort of dismiss it. They say, oh, OK, and put it in their file. I wrote to each and every doctor I could who delivered the particular women who were sent to me, and with one exception, they all denied that they'd actually given the drug. And what, wh Why was that, do you think? I think they're just scared. They were scared of being sued even back then. Wall of resistance I found at federal government level, even my own Royal College level. They're not accepting their responsibility towards our patients. The DES door have asked our Federal Health Minister Michael Waldridge, himself a doctor, to establish a register of their names. He's refused, in this letter saying there'd be little benefit, and a general publicity campaign for DES exposed people to identify themselves would create community anxiety without tangible benefit. DES was a massive medical mistake, one made in good faith no doubt, but the cover-up that's followed has only compounded the devastation for the tens of thousands involved. Dodds hadn't put a patent on DES, and he wanted it to be free for researchers to use and explore, and he hoped good would come from its discovery. Companies around the world, in Germany, Australia, and the US, were free to experiment with DES as they pleased. US-based pharmaceutical Eli Lilly and Company approved the drug for use in pregnant women during menopause and in livestock as a growth stimulant. DES is truly a horror story. To this day, it's estimated that up to 6 million women were given DES. The grandchildren of the women prescribed it have been affected with cancers and birth defects, infertility, and menstrual irregularities. To this day, there is a class action lawsuit against the producers of DES. There are advocacy groups called Daughters of DES for those affected.
As well as causing miscarriages in the women prescribed it for the prevention of miscarriages, the chemical is now understood to have epigenetic effects on the babies of the women who took the drug while pregnant, which are not evident until puberty, an oversight and failure of many magnitudes. Even though it was banned in 1971, it was still being used illegally in the 90s by cattle farmers as a fattening agent in their livestock. Studies from Italy from veal given DES show its presence in baby foods in alarmingly high amounts. More recent studies have shown to have a link to depression and psychological disorders in the offspring of the mothers who were prescribed it. There were multiple points of failure in this horror story. Although Dodds was cautious of interfering with the complexities of women's hormones, this caution was not strong enough to prevent disaster. Let's talk estrogen and the immune system. Mast cells are specialized cells of the immune system most famous for their role in allergic and inflammatory conditions. Mast cells release all kinds of inflammatory mediators, most famously histamine. Estrogen stimulates mast cells to release histamine, and histamine in turn acts on the ovaries to synthesize estradiol. This relationship between estrogens and histamine helps us understand menstrual-related inflammatory processes such as headaches, period pain, and edema. Estrogen is active in our nervous system and affects how we respond to stress. Because of this, some go as far as classing it as a stress hormone, which becomes more apparent when it's in excess. All endogenous hormones play their part. We want stress hormones, especially in acute situations, but what we don't want is chronically elevated levels. Now we understand that estrogen stimulates mast cells to produce histamine. Guess which hormone histamine activates? Cortisol. Histamine acts on the adrenal glands to stimulate the production of cortisol. Cortisol is one of the most well-known stress hormones. So estrogen causes mast cells to release histamine and histamine causes the adrenal glands to release cortisol. This is a simplification, but it is important to see how estrogen can have effects in both the immune system and the nervous system in many tissues and cells, not just the reproductive. But we can't talk about stress without talking about Dr. Hans Selye. Selye observed that estrogen administered to animals duplicated the shock phase of the stress reaction in its effect on circulation and energy metabolism. Since his observations, researchers have shown that estradiol is involved in activating transcription nuclear factor, which controls genes relating to inflammation, proliferation of cells, and apoptosis. We know that estradiol triggers the release of heat shock proteins whose job it is to respond to stresses such as cold, heat, UV light, and tissue damage. Another connection between stress and estrogen can be seen in early onset puberty, a phenomenon mainly observed in industrialized countries. It's estimated by some scholars that in the 1800s, the average age of Menarch was 17, while current estimates for the US are 12 to 13. Early Menarch is associated with adverse health outcomes, such as an increased risk of breast cancer, endometriosis and endometrial cancer, depression and obesity. So how does this relate to stress? Researchers made quite the stir in the 90s connecting stressful childhood events such as conflict, abuse, disconnected or disinterested parents with early menarche and puberty. Early puberty is due to elevated exposure or production of hormones including estradiol and estrone. Let's wrap this up. 
In the case of DES, patients failed for underestimating dangerous side effects of synthetic hormones. The doctors trusted the drug regulators, who said it was safe and effective, even when Dodd's research showed it caused miscarriage. The pharmaceutical companies released a product whose creator never intended it for healthy women. In the case of BPA, a synthetic estrogen was repurposed as a plastics additive and now pervades households, industry, and even our oceans. Giving women estrogenic substances as if they were life-saving growth hormones did not achieve the intended goals. Attempting to stabilize a complex hormonal regulatory system with a single input is incredibly primitive and naive. This appears to be the paradigm medicine has operated in for the last 120 years. Today, this paradigm has produced the idea that hormonal contraceptive, which contains synthetic estrogens, can be given liberally to women as a cure-all for reproductive disorders. The list of side effects for most hormonal contraceptive is long, including weight gain, strokes, blood clots, and cancer. If there were a white whale cure-all hormone for women, it should have been progesterone. Outside of the faulty estrogen paradigm, researchers and doctors such as Katharina Dalton, Raymond Peet, Lara Bryden and Gerilyn Pryor have been promoting and studying progesterone and its positive and protective effects. I see a synthesis of their research and ideas which produces a new paradigm better explaining the role of estrogen as a single actor in a symphony of actors, one which suggests progesterone as an underappreciated actor and demotes estrogen to its rightful place. Estrogen should not be thought of as a cure-all female reproductive hormone and needs to be understood in a greater context of human physiology if we are to tackle rising infertility and reproductive disorders. Let's not repeat history. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something. I'll see you in the next one.